Why, hello there, and welcome back to Watch is Live, the only show we film on Watchbox Reviews. Thank you to everyone joining us from around the world. I'm going to quickly cut and paste into our live chat box the link to our newest raffle. We are giving away a free Seiko Astron GPS Solar, a $1,600 luxury watch value. I can see our friends joining us from far flung. Andres Gutierrez, John Velez, Watt Family, Chip Wong, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Russell 996, Joe D, Noel G, F-A-Z-E, Matt Foster, Fjord, Prefect, Gordon L, High and Rising, welcome guys. Click that link and you will be able to win a free Seiko Astron GPS Solar Welcome, Aaron, from Brisbane, Australia. Let's jump straight into the money shot. You saw, you saw the logo on this video. You clicked, I deliver. This is the 2018 Omega Seamaster Railmaster Denim Edition. Now, you've seen the standard Railmaster, and you might remember the Trilogy model from last year. This is by far the most Nomos-like watch Omega has ever created. It gets a lot done with very little. The case is simple, all of satin finish. 46.7 millimeters lug to lug with pivoted end links. Anyone can wear this watch. 40 millimeters in diameter. The dial is a complex combination of variable width striations. And if you look closely, you can see it has elements of metallic blue, brown, violet, even a little bit of green and bronze in there. It has a complicated finish that's anything but the convenient cloying blue used by too many brands these days. And it has a gorgeous railroad style minutes and seconds track, subdued printing. It has a little bit of a gray Luminova coloration that glows blue at night with oversized indices, a gorgeous crosshair dial layout, and quarter Arabics that take you right back to the 1957 Railmaster. This is a special watch and probably one of the most broadly discussed new watches of the year. I love the fact that one of the most anticipated new watches is also one of the most accessible. This retails for 5,000. This one's selling pre-owned for less than that. 55 hour power reserve, a magnetic and 150 meters water resistant. Even the bracelet feels like it punches above its weight. Screws fixing, removable links, twin trigger, double deploy in action, very solid on the wrist and big gaps between links to vent the wrist. This is about as comfy and versatile as a watch gets. It's your dress watch, it's your sports watch, it's your weekend watch and your weekday watch. It might even be the watch you purchase on the basis that you can justify it to your wife along the lines of, well, you'll be able to wear it too, honey. Yeah, that's what you say. That won't be the reality, but it's a great line. Okay, now one that's only suitable for male wrists. This is the mighty Shajero LeCoult Master Compressor Diving Chronograph GMT Navy Seals Limited Edition. Part of a 2009 series, the watch is both a 65 hour power reserve vertical clutch column wheel chronograph, an extreme diver, and a GMT. It's all of these things. I guess I shouldn't say both because it's more than two things. It's everything all at once and the most desirable variant on the full vulcanized rubber strap with every individual link removable. Four triggers, a double deployment clasp, and each side of the clasp features a Rolex Easy Link style incremental adjustment system so you can actually make micro sizing on the fly, the equivalent of one half link by pulling out that micro adjustment inside these mini clasps. Now you turn it all over and this is the only place you're going to see the Navy SEALs branding on this one. You can see the warfare device of US Navy SEALs on the case back. I thought the partnership such as it was was a bit much and somewhat out of step with JLC's image. I have nothing against the watch itself however. 46 millimeters in grade 5 titanium. I don't I don't think the Navy SEALs thing made sense for JLC, but I do think the spirit of the old Polaris, the old deep sea diving alarm lives on in this watch. This isn't trying to be a retro watch and it isn't trying to be a petite watch. It's big, it's bold, it's hugely visible and because of the titanium, it's easily wearable on a small wrist. This is the aggressive modern sports watch that is missing from JLC's current catalog and you can see those compressor crowns. A half turn for the winding crown, a quarter turn for the chronograph pushers, and you get 1,000 meter water resistance. Very impressive ceramic bezel insert, and one of the chunkiest and most pleasing bezel feels you're going to find. Let, okay, let me see. Let me see if I can get you up close and personal. That right there is about as sharp and robustly mechanical as anything this side of Italian Campagnolo bike kit. That is a satisfying dive bezel. And then you've still got the GMT chronograph to work with. Okay, jump in and I can see high and rising. Tim, um, 
Go tell the Olympic heavyweight women's judo champion she can't wear that JLC. Now, why don't you? I don't want to be the one to break that news. <laughs> if you've got the wrist for it, you can wear the watch. That said, I barely have the wrist for it. It's a 46, but it's a compact 46. I'd say 16 centimeters, the lower limit. Let me show you a more universal dive watch that I absolutely adore. Call this one the Son of the Hulk. What was the Hulk's actual son in... in Planet Hulk. It was Scar, right? Scar with two A's. He would have worn this watch. A retail of $2,000 and one of the best new dive watches of 2018. This is the Oris Aquastate metallic green dial with matching gloss metallic ceramic insert. You can see it's a gloss green ceramic insert, metallic sunburst dial, 43.5 millimeters. The watch is only 50 millimeters lug to lug and a slim 12.8 millimeters thick, two tenths thicker than a sub. You can wear this with anything you can wear with a sub. And here's where the Aquas really pulls ahead of the Divers 65. Not just the fact that it has a ceramic bezel. That's nice. It's the fact that the bracelet is so much more deluxe with a built-in diving extension. You don't get that on the Diver 65. You get fake rivets. You don't get a useful dive extension. You get all of this with individual links that are sized with screws, and you get a twin trigger deployment system, so you have absolute security against accidental deployment. They even give you a display case back. And granted, it's a Salida SW200, so maybe not the most exotic movement in there, but you do get the chance to see it in a 300 meter diver. Rolex doesn't give you that consideration. Oris always value. This one retails for 2000 on a full bracelet, and it's an absolute bargain. I can't imagine waiting two years for a green Rolex sub when this is available now. I actually like this better. And I've seen it all. Okay, so from one green watch to another, we're jumping all over the place tonight. This isn't exactly a green watch. I'm cheating a bit. We've seen this one on the show, but every iteration of the FP Journe Tourbillon Souverain deserves a special shout out. This one on a glorious green, double alligator strap, green rectangular scales on the front, green small scales on the back. I'm not going to turn it over. I'm just going to show you the back of the strap right there. Double gator done the right way. That will be a half decade strap for someone barring severe glandular issues. Now, the tourbillon is the highlight of this watch. Of course, you're looking at a tourbillon cantilevered out on a single-sided half bridge with a filigree style polished tourbillon cage, and you can see beneath it the 18 karat red gold base plate of the movement. You'll note that the seconds hand is a deadbeat seconds hand. So let's count all the features here. Power reserve indicator, tourbillon, deadbeat seconds display, turn it all over, and you can see why this watch was a breakthrough when the first version of it bowed in 1999. It combines a remontoire de galette, a constant force device that meters a certain quantized and constant amount of force to the escapement every second. So the remontoire system, which ensures the escapement always gets the same amount of force from maximum wind to minimum wind of the mainspring barrel, is also responsible for the deadbeat second display on the dial. Now when it runs below 12 hours of power reserve, it disengages the deadbeat system, it becomes a sweep second. So FP Journe allows the watch to run continuously to exhaustion through those final 12 hours. It keeps best time when you wind it up completely. This is a gorgeous watch, all in platinum on the outside. Rose gold on the inside, the bezel for the dial, that is, the actual apertures that frames these displays, it is polished white gold, and this is as good as it gets. Now this one's 40 millimeters, I'm going to show it to you on my wrist. This is a great watch for all around use because it's slim, but at the same time as a white metal watch, it has that versatility that you could wear it with casual attire. Granted, it's a giant open dial tourbillon, but it's not quite as dressy as these things tend to be, and it's worlds removed from the likes of Breguet or Patek Philippe. This one's designed to be worn all the time. F.P. Journe designs them, engineers them, and has them built that way. Okay. I can see right here, uh, we have Edward Ledden saying that tourbillon puts even Richard Mill to big shame. Richard Mill does not have a constant force tourbillon right now, so totally different horses for different courses, but between generic Richard Mill and that particular tourbillon, I am all over that FP Journe. Now let's jump across the border to Saxony in Germany, and let's take a look at fine finishing of an entirely different description. In 2007, the Panamatic XL collection bowed, and this Panamatic Chrono XL was one of the flagships, caliber 9501. It's a flyback chronograph and a weird one. It has an inverted chronograph control system, so the flyback, you, pardon me, I'm doing this upside down. The flyback is actually located at two o'clock where you'd conventionally see the start stop. 
Now the system, I need to wind it up so it works properly, the system is propelled by a caliber 95-1 manual wind Glasuta Original, because they use the hard G in Germany. Hand finished caliber of extraordinary description. So you can see everything on the case back, Again, this thing confuses me constantly because it's upside down, but you can see the interaction of the column wheel and the levers of the chronograph mechanism. You can see the column wheel, the lateral clutch, which moves into and out of contact with the chronograph center wheel, and you can see where the clutch is being driven off the fourth wheel of the going train. So that's what's actually happening here as the system moves away from and into contact with that center wheel. You can also see that every screw is blued, every bridge decorated with glasuta stripes. You can see straight grained brushing across all of the levers as well as the clutch of the chronograph system. And note this, the chronograph lateral clutch is fully jeweled. That is something you will see only on chronographs of the absolute highest grade. A fully jeweled lateral yoke is the domain of the paddocks, the longas, and yes, the geos of the world. Now let me show you the dial side of this watch because it's rather spectacular. The chronograph functions have been separated from the primary dial and note that the primary dial is loomed. Now the chronograph functions feature a oversized central superimposed floating seconds ring and then chronograph minutes adjacent to that on the side. So the system featuring that flyback action and its inverted chronograph triggers works as such. You can actually stop it and you can reset it conventionally, but it is a very impressive 42.5 millimeter rose gold watch. A bit much for me in terms of the attention it draws. It's just a little bit too much gold for me. But if you're considering a gold Hublot, Audemars Piguet, Rolex, anything in colored metal, you need to consider the rarity of these, how few of them are made. Geo's only making 15,000 to 20,000 watches a year at the peak of its production in the 2000s. Today, that's more like 10 to 12,000 watches a year, and very few are these high-end flagship complications. It's absolutely red hot. This is a special watch, and they do things differently than Longa, and I'm gonna prove that because I have a Longa right here. This is the Grand Longa One, the post-2011 latest version with the 40.9 millimeter case. These are very special. Uh, since the 2011 model year, there's been a properly sized movement for the Grand Longa. So you have the larger case size, but with the same dial layout that the Longa One made famous and iconic back in 1994. This is a great example of value in watches because these sell for $10,000 less than list. And, and that's the dearest example beautifully made, and you can see on the case back, I may as well wind this one up, twin mainspring barrel, three-day power reserve, entirely hand-finished with a freehand engraved half-bridge for the balance. Okay, now that it's underway, let's take a closer look at what you're getting for your money. Finishing in Glasuta style, this is a style that is based on old Saxon pocket watches, but it's actually a modern invention of Longa in the wristwatch format. So you have the giant three-quarter style bridge with strategically placed access ports for servicing. You have all of the jewels from the twin mainspring barrels, which you can see in their chaton at top, through the drivetrain set in chaton. The chaton are actually gold cradles for the jewels. They're fixed by heat blued screws. It's a throwback to the pocket watch era when machining of bridges was more difficult and tolerances weren't as tight. It was easier to put the jewels in specially manufactured chaton that could then be removed for easier servicing. Now you'll also note that there is a freehand engraved half bridge or balance cock and no two of these are exactly the same. Every longa features this structure. At least one freehand engraved that is individual component. No two are ever exactly alike because this is done without a lathe. It's done with a chisel and it's done with a hammer. You can also see that there's traditional anglage in the Swiss fashion. As I move the watch through the light, you'll note the edges of these access ports are flashing bright and those beads of light moving around their edge show you where the mirrored sides are. There's also an even and tightly spaced prolage engine turning on the base plate. Gorgeous. You'll note that there is some black polish on the cap of the half bridge for the escape wheel, as well as on the swan's neck fine adjustment regulator, which these days is actually used for adjusting beat rate. A beautiful watch, and how useful is this? It's loomed. This could be your all-arounder. Gorgeous stuff. White gold.
and at 40.9 millimeters, the perfect size. But let's say you want to style a bit more with your longa, and you want something that's farther off the beaten path even than a grand longa. You want a grand longa with a complication, well then you want the grand longa moon phase. This is a stunning three-dimensional moon phase. As you can see, the disc itself rides atop a base featuring the cosmos inset on the center dial. You can see the primary dial justified to what would conventionally be the nine o'clock side of the watch features a sensational solid gold moon. It's not a metal deposit. It is a solid gold disc that is then colored to achieve the image of the night sky. You'll also note that the classical Longa 1 layout is present and correct. Oversized date with white gold frame, the three-day power reserve indicator, and a sub-seconds that just kisses the outer circumference of the minutes track. All applied indices and stylized Roman numerals, quarter Roman numerals, turn it all over, more fun. Every Longa is absolute watch porn on its case back. I don't necessarily love that term, and I don't use it universally, but it just rolls off the tongue when you're showing a piece like this. Absolutely sensational. With Longa, I don't want to say you get what you pay for. You get more than what you pay for. Because of discounts and pre-owned reduction from MSRP with these, it's not like buying a Jorn. It's not like buying a Rolex. Unfortunately, these don't quite command what they're worth. That's to your advantage as a collector. Now, from Germany to another non-traditional watchmaking country that does it very well, we're going to Japan. And what might be my favorite spring drive? This is a very special piece. Keeping the Crador series separate, this SPGC007 is an appropriate combination of British racing green dial with the Appalachian 007 appended to SBGC. So what does that mean? Well, it means it's a spring drive chronograph GMT in a 44 millimeter Zeratsu finished case. Now that sounds like a lot of marketing speak, Zeratsu polish. They talk about it being something that is traditional, artisanal, executed by hand. It's not correctly compared to the polishing of Japanese swords. That's going over the top. What it is, however, is a distinctly Seiko method of finishing cases by hand. It is absolutely artisanal. It is absolutely done by hand, by eye, by feel, and by experience. And on that count, the optically smooth finish that you get on the sides of these cases, done against a rotating tin plate, again, just by hand pressure and eye, produces cases that are qualitatively better than what you'll get from the likes of Rolex, Omega, and Breitling. Those are industrially perfect. This one is millimetrically perfect from side to side. You won't find differing measurements about the bevels or the polished case flanks. What you will find is more human warmth and evidence of the artisan's hand than you'll find on a Swiss product of equivalent price. Now, if you look at the dial, you'll see more of your money at work. Grand Seiko dial furniture is some of the best in the business. Faceted, alternately polished and grained, Dauphine hands at center. You'll note that each individual index is hand placed. It's been faceted and polished using diamond tipped tools by hand. There are artisans who do nothing but finish these little pieces, micrometrically identical, one after the other, and that's their job. You're benefiting from a broad range of talents when you buy one of these. Spring drive movement built by a watchmaker, another artisan involved in the process. 50 joules, three day power reserve, and you can see that unidirectional governing wheel moving continuously in one direction. What you can't quite see, because I'm gonna turn the watch over and give you full view, is that these are all column wheel vertical clutch mechanical chronographs attached to the spring drive caliber. So you get a traditional vertical clutch column wheel chronograph, and you can see the action right there, just like a Swiss mechanical movement, but then you get the uniquely Grand Seiko spring drive, which gives you a watchmaker made movement with no motors, no batteries, no capacitors, mechanical watch sole with quartz watch precision of plus or minus 15 seconds per month. And now you can really see that matte British racing green dial. This watch is impossible to find. That might be my favorite spring drive right there. Okay. Okay, now, boom. Guys, let's talk about something that's a bit more accessible, but just as Seiko. And dare I say, actually straddles the fence between Grand Seiko and Seiko. This is almost unfair, but it's the Seiko Prospects 
High Beat Diver SLA25. It's a tribute to the reference 6159-7001 of 1968, which was the first ever automatic winding high beat dive watch. This recapitulates the case form as well as the strap design, but it's basically a Grand Seiko masquerading as a Seiko. It uses caliber 8L55, 10 beats per second, 36,000 vibrations per hour, 55 hour power reserve, watchmaker assembled and regulated. Now this is where things get really cool because it also features the Zeratsu case finish that you get on a Grand Seiko. It's the exact same thing. It's done by the same people. This is actually made in the Shizuki Ishii watch studio where the Grand Seiko pieces are made. And the finishing of the case is that same artisanal touch that you get with a Grand Seiko. Now check this out. Where is the case back? The whole watch is a monoblock, so it's part of the dying family of front loaders. It's a rare breed to find a watch made today, like dive watches were made sometimes in the 60s and 70s. The original 6159-7001 was made this way. But because it is a monoblock case, everything goes in the dial side. The movement goes in, the dial goes in, everything goes in, and then the bezel, the case top, and the crystal all cap it. It is a very sophisticated system that allows the watch to be impervious to helium intrusion. You'll see HE gas written on the back. Well, what does that mean? Because it doesn't have a helium escape valve. It means that due to sophisticated case construction and gaskets, this watch doesn't need a helium escape valve. Grand Seiko finishing on the case exterior. Grand Seiko movement on the case interior. 1500 piece limited series in stainless steel, 44 millimeters. This one wears like a treat. It even has a vintage inspired narrow lug spacing and a vintage inspired pyramid pattern silicone cone tropic style strap that is an absolute treat on the wrist. Over engineered, believe it, the strap minder itself features both polished and satin finish and is made of metal. This is a gorgeous watch, but here's my favorite feature. Not just the monoblock case, but a stoplight style seconds hand. This watch has it all. That's a vintage element that you'll see on some vintage Grand Seiko divers and also the Jager 20 ATM Parisian built Jager Le Coult diver from the 60s. Okay, from thick and chunky to absolutely razor slim. I love what Bulgari is doing these days, guys. We have to talk about the Octo Finissimo Revolution Limited Edition. Now, Revolution Magazine, along with Watch Time, probably the only two magazines still worth reading in the watch space. What hath Revolution wrought? Well, let's take a look. Waco of Revolution worked directly with Bulgari to create this 50-piece DLC Grade 5 Titanium Limited Edition of 50 pieces. Now you can see it's only 5.35 millimeters thick. The movement itself is both extraordinarily broad at 36.6 millimeters and extraordinarily thin at 2.23 millimeters. 65 hour power reserve, you'll note the case back power reserve indicator features the Revolution masthead and the Revolution Red Star. That's the only co-branding on the watch. All of the finish, those Cote de Genève, the polished beveled engelage of the edge of each bridge, the black polished screws, this is all done by hand in Le Sentier, Switzerland, within a stone's throw of Blancpain, Breguet, Audemars Piguet, and Jager Le Coult by the old Gerald Genta Daniel Roth works. They are manufacture bulgari today. You want more? You got it. Skeletonized matte finish grade 5 titanium dial. And you can see underneath the skeletonized indices, the stencil over the base, the perlage finished base plate of the BVL 128 movement. 50 of these made very fine, gorgeous pieces. They are feather light. The whole thing is about 45 grams on the wrist. And note, the attention to detail, the chromed cap with the double knurling about the crown and then a polished ceramic cabochon insert. Absolutely gorgeous. Let me show you this one on the wrist. It's 40 millimeters in diameter, 46 millimeters lug to lug, and only 5.35 millimeters thick. This watch wears like a, a second skin. It disappears under any cuff. It hasn't met a sleeve it doesn't love. This is a sporty watch, guys. It's not a dive watch, it's not an aquatic watch, but it is an all the time watch. Grade 5 tie and DLC coated to give it that gorgeous anthracite tone. It's a combination of curves and angles, sharp creases and arcs. Absolutely sensational. This is what Bulgari does so well today. And with only 50 of these in circulation, if you've ever had a hankering to read Revolution, read it with this on your wrist.
a very rare and special piece. Okay, let's go from high horology to entry-level luxury horology. Let's go Bell & Ross, and possibly the most interesting Bell & Ross of 2018. Last year, Bell & Ross debuted the first ever dive watch in the rectangular instrument series that is the icon of Bell & Ross. Well, the Parisian-based watchmaker that builds in Switzerland gave us the instrument diver BRO3 bronze this year, 42 millimeters in bronze. They've decided to use a highly resistant bronze alloy that patinas slowly. You can see the case back is actually beautifully polished and stylized with an antique diving helmet and a herringbone motif underneath. 90, 999 pieces. It is a limited series. This is a great watch because the patina will take effect. The bronze is gorgeous now, but because it's designed to age slowly, it's not going to look like something dredged up from the Titanic or the Lusitania after two years on your wrist. So it's going to age, it's going to gain charm and character, but it's not going to wear down. Now listen to this dive bezel because this is among the best in the business. It's right up there with JLC, Doxa, and Panerai. Big, chunky, and satisfying. I don't know if this strap is necessarily for you, but it does come with an accessory strap and the tools to swap out. Take a look at this thing on the blood orange alligator leather strap that's fitted. 42 millimeters on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. It's a gorgeous piece. The BR03 case is 42. The old BR01 is 46. This is a better size for most folks. And here's the key for me. 12.7 millimeters thick. It's basically a Rolex Submariner in that respect. Easy to wear, highly stylish. And Bell and Ross, probably the best value for money in, in luxury horology. Not a handmade watch, but a luxury watch. And I distinguish between high horology and luxury horology by saying high horology involves hand finishing, hand tuning, regulation, hand decoration. It has to involve the artist's hand, the artisan's touch and experience. Luxury horology means a watch that has a permanent secondary market so you can sell it to someone who will buy it used and it can be serviced indefinitely. That's a luxury watch, something that is not disposable, which is how a $2,000 Oris on this table tonight can be called a luxury watch. It's indefinitely serviceable and resellable. Okay, jumping to an independent brand that I love out of Britain. This is Bremont and one of their finest recent references. In 2014, they launched their collaboration with Boeing, and it makes sense. They're both aviation-driven companies. Boeing obviously constructing aircraft, Bremont, founded by two pilots and aeronautical engineers who have a hankering for aviation watches. This is the Boeing Model 1 GMT, 43 millimeters in grade five titanium. You can see that it features a ceramic insert about its bi-directional rotating pilot style bezel. And then there's a second time zone in 24 hour format. Now all the Bremont men's watches are chronometers and you'll note on the case back, two things that I find intriguing. First, you can see the movement, chronometer grade, with a chronometer grade balance. You know that because it has the larger splayed spokes. And then you can see that there are three elastomers that are suspending the movement inside the case. This is exactly like what you'll find on Richard Mille, Chagere Le Coult, and other brands that advertise highly shock resistant watches. Suspension of the movement from the case itself. The movement is separated from the case and the intermediary between the two, the connection, these three elastomers. So the watch has blowout protection, so the crystal can't be discharged if you're in an explosively decompressing cockpit environment. You'll probably never need that. It's 100 meters water resistant. That's highly practical. And it's highly shock resistant, so you're not gonna damage the staffs of the escape wheel or the balance. Absolutely gorgeous, and the price is right. This is a watch that retails for 4,400. Sells for about two thirds of that pre-owned. It's a gorgeous piece because it's all subdued. So many Bremont watches are big and polished. This one is beautiful because less is more. With only a few polished accents, it's an everyday watch for a human-sized wrist. And the reason for that is that Bremont uses this case form that physically separates the lugs from the case band. That's how you can wear a 43 on a tiny wrist. Even though it has a broad stance, it curves around the wrist. Okay. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about another pilot watch from maybe even a more traditional pilot's watch manufacturer. Before the English brothers of Bremont were a uh, glow in their father's eye or gleam in their father's eye, IWC was doing pilot's watches. And the Mark 18 is the latest in the series, but this is the Mark 18 
Top Gun Miramar. It's a little bit bigger than the standard 40 millimeter Mark 18, and it's a little bit more ceramic. So you can see you've got that scratch resistant ceramic case, all of high polish. It's nicely matched to the titanium hardware of the case, which is all of a satin metal finish. The dial is the Miramar style, so subdued simulated patina. I normally hate simulated patina when it's something that seems out of place that's sort of there for a facile nostalgia play. When it's part of the color palette of the watch and it's coherently phrased by the designers, then I have no problem. Here there's a combination of matte tobacco brown base, the simulated patina ecru colored loom, and then a sort of subdued hour register at center in red. What makes this watch a little bit interesting is that the minutes and seconds scale is maximized and the hours are quite subdued. They're not the dominant calibration on the dial. The watch does feature an ETA high grade caliber. You know that because it's caliber 30110. 35110 is the Sleeta SW300. 3110 is the ETA. 60 meters water resistant. It has that same crystal and seal discharge protection. So you can also wear this one in an explosively decompressing cabin, but this one also has an anti-magnetic Faraday cage for the movement. What should we cap off? What should we use to cap off the show? I've hit just about everything. We were talking pilot's watches. We were talking complications. We were talking about traditional aviation watch manufacturers, and there is none more traditional than Breitling. And this, guys, is where we're going to end the show. The Breitling, the flagship Navitimer, the Breitling Navitimer Retropont. This one debuted in 2017 and is arguably the most interesting watch that Breitling makes. 45 millimeters in stainless steel. This is a coaxial crown retropont. So you actually have the chronograph pusher coaxial with the crown and the retropont system uses a highly sophisticated mechanism known as a decoupler. So the decoupler allows the retropont system to operate without drag. And this is something that Longa used. Longa actually has in the double split and the triple split a decoupler system that prevents the system from dragging when the split second is activated. It's very sophisticated stuff and it's one of the reasons this watch was so expensive when new. Now you can see it is big, it is beefy, it is an impressive presence. It's a chronometer, it's a 70 hour power reserve, it's an in-house caliber. It's the AB03 so this is as tough technically as it gets from Breitling. An absolutely mesmerizing complication and internally one of the most impenetrable engineering feats among Rolex, Omega, and Breitling. Rolex is impressive. They're not doing a split. I have to say that this is probably the top mainstream flight chronograph you can buy right now, especially since it preserves the traditional Navitimer circular slide rule bezel, which I sorely miss on the new Navitimer 8s. Let me show you this operation a little better because it is tough to see the Ratropon system in action. You can see the second hand just underneath. There we go. Breitling Navitimer Ratropon. The Cadillac of pilot's watches. Okay, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Everyone who tuned in, everyone who got up early, stayed up late, I thank you. You guys make this the best job in the world and you make it possible. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew. This has been Watches Live on Watchbox Reviews. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.